Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everyone. On behalf of the World Council of Churches Management Team, I welcome you to the third session of Theological Reflections on Hate Speech and Whiteness. This week, we have planned you know, five webinars. The theme of the first webinar was white privilege in COVID-19 and white supremacy in mission. The title of the second session was Legacy of Slavery, Structural Racism and Religion. And today's session, the title is Religion, White Supremacy and Aboriginal Peoples. These webinars are part of the WCC commitment to address the issue of racism. WCC's commitment to deal with racism goes back to its establishment in 1948, but it became part of a programmatic response in 1968. With the end of apartheid uh, and in recent times, the WCC governing bodies express their desire to continue with this theme through a series of statements. And that lead us to a cross-cutting program on racism, which is to start in 2021. All these webinars have got specific objectives. The first one is to confirm that hate speech and whiteness are two overarching issues for the broader global manifestation of racism today. And the second one is to strengthen the ecumenical theological reflection, accompaniment and advocacy in the area of racial justice. And the third one is to underline the importance of applying a framework of intersectionality in ongoing WCC programmatic work on overcoming racism. As was the case with the previous sessions, today's session will be moderated by Reverend Dr. Fernando Ernst, who is a member of the WCC Central Committee. He is also a member of Association of Mennonite congregations in Germany and moderator of the reference group and theological study group of the World Council of Churches Pilgrimage of Justice and Peace. He is professor of theology in the Faculty of Religion and Theology at Free University in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And before I hand over to him to start this session, let us pray. God, who knows all things, we know you love us. From the very beginning, your love, your loving mercy has been poured out upon us. You have loved us like a mother embracing us in your lap. Like a father, you have watched over us, guiding us each day. We want to live our lives for you. Please continue to guide our thoughts and control our actions as we reflect on religion, white supremacy, and Aboriginal peoples. Give us the strength to continue striving for a world without racism for all people here on earth. For we believe that another world is possible here on earth. In Christ Jesus, we pray, amen. I hand over to you, Fernando. Thank you very much, Isabel Thierry, Professor, Deputy General Secretary of the World Council of Churches. It's a joy to be with you again. Uh, and it's good to start this session again with a moment of prayer. So thanks a lot, Isabel. I welcome everyone. Uh, also from my side, a warm welcome to an international audience. Uh, we know that a lot of people are uh, following these sessions and that is, that is wonderful. That is a great support also for us here in this uh, Zoom meeting. 
Um, I welcome the speakers and the, uh, the participants in the discussion. Uh, some of them you will meet today here. Uh, all of us, uh, we are either members of the theological study group of the Pilgrimage of Justice and Peace program of the World Council, uh, or we have been involved uh, in a uh, conference in Tokyo last year uh, when we started this theological reflections on the urgent issue of racism, racial injustice. Now, uh, today, as has been announced, so we will focus on religion uh, in general, in more general terms, interreligious dialogue, possibilities about that, white superiority, and Aboriginal peoples. This is uh, quite important uh, to focus on these aspects today, and I look forward to the presentations of the speakers uh, that we have. Um, you want, if you want to know more about the other sessions uh, that we've had already, uh, you can always go to the website of the World Council of Churches. Uh, you find the recordings there, so you can you can see the rich discussions that we had uh, in the two sessions. So uh, we are now in the middle of this webinar. Um, that is uh, all I need to say today. Uh, yesterday, I explained already that racism is one of the four topics uh, that we have identified in the Pilgrimage of Justice and Peace. The reference group has traveled to many communities around the world, and racism has been one of the issues that we came across in every single context. So uh, it, is, uh, it is high time for us to do some theological reflection on this issue. The first speaker of today, uh, may I introduce Dr. Elizabeth Joy. Um, Elizabeth is a member of the Malankara Orthodox Syrian Church. Originating in India, she is now based in the United Kingdom. Elizabeth's research interest focuses on identities of the marginalized and its relevance to liberation and transformation in communities. Elizabeth Joyce serves the churches together in England as a director and trustee. She is a member of the Council of Reference and Advisory Body of the Board of Trustees at British Student Christian Movement and a good friend of the ecumenical movement, of course. Elizabeth, welcome to this meeting. We look forward to your presentation. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Fernando, for your very kind words and Isabel for inviting me to present a paper at this webinar. Today, my paper is titled, Hate Speech and Religion, Can Interfaith Dialogue Shape Christian Theology? The socio-political context Sorry, I'm just. Um, can you please help me with the PowerPoint? Melvin? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Also, if... yeah. The socio political context, context determine our theological approach. This paper arises from the current COVID-19 context that has created unprecedented challenges. It has unmasked the stark realities of racism, sexism, and casteism with the undergirding common denominator, the poverty. I place hate speech and religion in this context and explore it. Next slide, please. The last two seven webinars, we have been dealing with whiteness and its devastating role for 400 years. Today, I would like to begin this paper taking you to 2,500 years back in history. And I would like to begin with the story of Buddha. When Buddha passed by a village in North India belonging to Kosala Kingdom, people ask Buddha why, a different, why different faith leaders expound 
and explain only their doctrines, the doctrines of others they despise, revile, and pull to pieces. They say, Venerable Sir, there is doubt, there is uncertainty in us concerning which of these reverend contemplatives and Brahmins are speaking the truth and which are telling lies. We see the tool, hermeneutics of suspicion, applied then itself in relation to hate speech and religion. Where are we as Christians today? I anchor this paper with the question that Samartha raised back in the late 70s. How do other faiths respond to the Christian initiatives that dominate the dialogue specifically in relation to the theologies of religion? I raise the question, how can we go to a round table dialogue with other religions moving forward with our Christian theology, specifically Christology overcoming hate speech. Next slide, please. Legal scholars in the United States coined the term hate speech in the late 1980s. Mari Matsuda first used the term hate speech in her seminal article titled Res Public Response to Racist Speech, considering the victim's story to highlight that the legal system in the United States failed the victims of racist speech. This is an approved weapon of war. Social distancing is becoming the norm in COVID-19 context. Anthony Cortes puts social distancing in perspective in relation to hate speech as follows. Social distance refers to the grades and degrees of understanding acceptance and that usually characterizes personal and social relations, especially between ethnic or racial groups. The more inauspicious the stereotypes about a group, the greater social distance. Next slide, please. The term religion is denoted in my mother tongue Tamil by words like Samayam, that also means time, or madam, that also means insanity, and sampradayam or parambrim, that means tradition. Saivism is one of the main religions thriving in South India, and it is believed to be in existence from around 600 BCE, which means 2,500 years ago, along with Buddhism and Jainism. It is still there today. Both B Buddhism and Jainism were not welcomed or even tolerated in South India. The conflicts were intense, leading to killing and bloodshed. So hate speech was very much prevalent and is so even today. Next slide, please. In North India, the Aryan race is believed to have reformed its religious beliefs and practices. Assimilation and annihilation was a method even then. Paulus Mark Gregorius believes this strategy exists in Indian political actions, even in the 20th century. According to Samatha, it took a few decades after dismantling colonialism for Vatican and WCC to come out with positive statements about people of other faiths. It happened in 1965 and 1971, respectively. We have gone a long way in history, and I would like to point to Dr. Agnes Abum, the moderator of the WCC, addressing the G20 Interfaith Forum on Africa, calling us to work with all faiths and communities, saying, the pandemic has exposed and exacerbated many of the inequities and injustices that are prevailing. The reality of living in multi-religious and diverse contexts ensure that our activities and commitments are carried out in a spirit of solidarity and 
calls us to be accountable to the society we live in. Next slide, please. The above statement, along with the joint statement of WCC, and along with Pontifical Council for the Interreligious Dialogue, through following direction, affirm what the wounded world requires. Serving a wounded world in interreligious solidarity, a Christian call to religious and action during COVID-19 and beyond. Its purpose is to encourage churches and Christian organizations to reflect on the importance of interreligious solidarity in the world wounded by the COVID-19 pandemic. The document offers a Christian action for interreligious solidarity that can inspire and confirm the impulse to serve a wounded world caused not only by COVID-19, but also many other wounds. Next slide, please. Cone reveals that the need for dialogues and connecting with communities in other parts of the world, the dialogue partners need not necessarily have interpersonal, uh, but intrapersonal model due to the double religious traditions that most of us share. One of the ways that I suggest is to move forward looking at what is presented in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Here, when we look at the image of Christ, although this text again runs the risk of Christ being projected as the judge sitting on a throne, summoning all the nations, yet it overcomes the risk of hate speech against other religions. This, I feel, will express solidarity with other faiths and beliefs. It will move us to a stage of solidarity, which is very essential. Next slide, please. In conclusion, I would like to say that the topic hate speech and religion helps us to look at the reality that we live from time immemorial, although a huge jump is made crossing history between 1940s to 1980s with respect to WCC's initiatives coming to the current understanding we are called to serve the wounded world. I urge to identify Christian response in relation to its mission and theology, as well as interfaith dialogue. I can confirm that we are on a safe path, although still on the bullock cart with respect to interfaith relations, but in touch with the realities of the current world crises, both racism and COVID-19. Christ as the judge is an inclusive metaphor. He will not judge based on color, caste, class, religion, or region, but practically on what we do and don't do and to whom we do it. Our identities will be revealed as an oppressor or oppressed or liberator, overcoming hate speech that leads to hate actions or vice versa. Christ empowers us to work in solidarity with people of all religions and beliefs in our search for the truth. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, for leading us into this session with this paper. Um, we, I hope we will have a chance to, to discuss it a bit. Uh, before we do that, uh, I want to invite uh, Sione Habea to uh, respond to this paper. Uh, Sione Habea is a native pastor of the Free Wesleyan Church of Tonga, that's the Methodist Church, and he's a research fellow at Trinity Theological Seminary, uh, Aotearoa in New Zealand, as well as with the Public and Contextual Theology Research Center at Charles Stewart University in Australia. Uh, Sione has been uh, a member of the theological study group on the pilgrimage of justice and peace from the first moment on 
And uh, whoever had the chance to listen to Sione's Bible studies uh, will never forget those moments. Um, Sione, go ahead, please. Dr. Joy, Vandanalu, many thanks for your paper. I appreciate that you take the subject of hate speech back to the hearing of the Buddha and forward to the breathless, breathless situations of Black Lives Matter and COVID-19 with a determined focus on interfaith dialogue. I first acknowledge that I'm not a student of the theologies of interfaith dialogue. So please take the following observations as coming from an observer or somewhat of an outsider. First, I turn back to Professor Matsuda an Asian American of Japanese descent from Hawaii, one of the islands of Pacifica that's occupied by the USA. Thank you for introducing me and I'm guessing several of us to Professor Matsuda's work. Matsuda explained that hate speech arose as a catchphrase in the context of the failure of the US legal system to serve justice for victims of racism. Given the focus of the PJP shifting to the Americas in 2021, I wonder if a closer theological reflection on this failure, this failure in the legal system, this jurisprudential failure, if we can engage that. While I agree that it is necessary to listen and attend to the cries of the people on the streets, we also need to dig into the legalized roots of systemic racism. It is not enough to join the march and cry against police brutality. We also need to address the legal failures across, along with the political, economic, ecological, theological, and cultural ideologies that require policing and punishment in our societies. One of the moves by the first world governments, especially the USA, but also Australia, at the height of COVID and the Black Lives Matter movements in the middle of 2020, around June, was to roll back ecological protection so that big businesses like mining industry may help kickstart the economy. So we need to see the matrix that sustains whiteness and racism. There is an ecological burden from the economic policies of every government. And economy is one of the platforms on which racism plays out. All of these, economy, ecology, and racism, are sanctioned by rules, regulations, and laws, which for Professor Matsuda have failed to deliver justice. The so-called justice system is broken. It does not uphold the justice that the pilgrimage of justice and peace aims for. So we need to look at the legal system, not just in the USA, but throughout our racist context. Second, I offer the words of Matsuda in a different study. We are the children of our past and the parents of our future. Like the Krimke sisters, these are two sisters in, in Canada. In the year 1868, they publicly declared that a black man, son of their slave owning brother was their nephew. Like these sisters, we cannot listen to those who say it's not yet time. We know it's time, our time, and we will make it so. Third, I go back to scriptures. I suggest that it is time, it is time to again interrogate the contribution of the Christian Bible to the systemic culture of racism. It is time to again interrogate the Bible's celebration of Israel's occupation of Canaan and Palestine. It is time to again interrogate the Bible's condemnation of Gentiles and Goyim. It is time to again interrogate the Bible's place in the formation of the doctrine of discovery. It is time to again interrogate 
the use of the Bible to justify the trade of black bodies and the, and the transatlantic passage. It is time to again interrogate the Bible's otherworldliness. It is time to again interrogate the Bible's blessing upon the status of poverty. It is time to again interrogate the authority that communities of faith give to the Bible in such a way that it becomes the photo op object for effed up Christian political leaders and so on and so on. It is time to again interrogate the scriptures on which the Christian participation in interfaith dialogues stand. Finally, I appreciate the shift from interfaith dialogue to interfaith solidarity that you, end up, that you advocate. My prayer, Elizabeth, is that the days of interfaith interrogation and revolution are not too far off. It is time. Malo Obito. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sione. Um, very well spoken, I want to say from my side. Elizabeth, do you want to immediately uh, react to that before I invite others also to join? Yes. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Sione, first of all, I would like to thank you very much. And I deeply appreciate your response to my paper. I'm really blessed to have you as my respondent. And as always, you seem to prod us. I cannot agree with you any more than this. You have nailed the points. And I would definitely agree with you when you say that we have still to do a lot more, especially with reference to our scriptures. Um, and when you say that it is not, it is time that we do the many things that we have to, to pave the way for uh, uh, better relations with other faiths. I say amen to that. I can only uh, look back at uh, oh, the miracle at Cana when Jesus said, it is not at my time. And then we begin to ask when was his time to do what he wanted to do. And by the end of the miracle, we see that Christ's time is not when we think Christ has to act, but it is the time when the least, the last and the lost come in to the weddings. I think uh, specifically within the Indian context, we have two sets of people, the invited and the uninvited to the weddings. The uninvited wait outside. They come in at the last minute to take the remains of what the invited people have left over. That is the time Christ acts to give the best. And so I'm very happy that you brought in that. And I believe that um, uh, when you say that just going out on the streets is not enough, uh, for me, I feel that engaged body solidarity is the hermeneutical key. It takes a lot of courage, especially at COVID times for people to march on the streets when we see the people of uh, the privileged color forming a circle around the people of color protecting them from the police. This shows a difference in the um, engaged body solidarity. And we need those things to uh, take us forward in our search for truth. And I think I will leave it there and pick it up later. But I remain indebted to you and thank you for your feedback. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Philip Peacock. Uh, thank you, thank you, Fernando. Uh, thank you, Akka, so much for your paper. I, 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 I liked uh, the trajectories that you were fleshing out here, but I have a particularly Protestant question to you. Um, in the end of your paper, you suggest that 
as rightly so, and scripture does testify to this, that Christ will judge based on what we do, naming who's the oppressed and who's the oppressor. And that is certainly one trajectory in scripture, but how do we account for grace here? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philip. I believe that uh, um, the grace of God you know, it, uh, we see it acting in different levels. And for me, even to bring back people who have been on the margins, who have been longing in their search for the truth, to let them find the truth. That itself I feel is grace, God's grace, both for uh, uh, the people on the right and on the left, because God opens their eyes. Definitely, um, I feel they will have a chance later, but at the final judgment, people are divided according to what they have done and to whom they have done. And the people to whom we are expected to uh, show our deeds, our good deeds are the least the lost and the last. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elizabeth. May I may I add a question uh, to the same point? Um, isn't it when it when it comes to racism and to uh, whiteness, isn't it more complex than? Uh, I mean, is it always so easy to see who is uh, doing oppressive actions and who is doing liberating actions? Um, isn't it the fact that we are, and, and Sione was, was hinting to that also with some of his words, at least in my reading, that it is somehow we are interwoven into systems, uh, into systemic racism. So none of us finds themselves um, un, untouched or, or detached from, from this systemic racism. Um, so I, I wonder if that is, um, how, how, how would you react to that? Um, yes, thank you, Fernando. Um, definitely the systemic uh, racism, it's not as uh, easy as we talk. And many times I repeatedly say that um, combating racism just along the lines of color is not enough. So when we are judged for me, I would say that if we go with the question, uh, who did this? Did the white or the color or the black, did they do it? Or what has been done? Mm. I think the focus here is what was done, not who. Mm -hmm. So when the focus is on what was done, I feel it may become a little more easier than us asking the question, who did it? Who did it will again take us back into that uh, uh, perpetual trap again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But to focus on what is done uh, would be a way out. Right. Yeah, thank you. What has been done and what has not been done. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That is, uh, I mean, yes. that's Matthew yes. 25, yes. right? Yes. Uh, yes. So it's also yes. the things that we yes. that we didn't do or that exactly. we don't do. Exactly. And Christ coming as judge, we see that uh, um, Mari Matsuda focuses on uh, the failure of the U.S. Uh, legal system. And uh, here we project the possibility of having Christ as the judge mm. and then uh, overcoming or combating racism, hate speech, and everything. Thank you. Right, thanks. Pointing again to the, to the legal aspect. I see Susan, uh, one more question, and then we move on with the next paper. Go ahead, Susan. Susan Derber from the UK. Thank you, um, and thank you both to Elizabeth and Sione. I, I wanted to ask a question about um, the relationship between interfaith dialogue and interfaith solidarity. And um, I remember in my long ago youth, I was taught mission and um, 
Interfaith Issues by uh, Leslie Newbegin. And I remember being struck by, yes, I really am that old. Um, I'm being struck that he said that true dialogue means that we engage in the risk of the kind of encounter which leaves us vulnerable and which is also one in which we can be honest about critique and, and uh, engagement with the other. And I wonder, I'm looking for the space that is between anything that would be hate speech, but also anything that is simply just listening and, and not critiquing or engaging. And I wonder whether there is, um, I, I would not want interfaith solidarity to be pressed to the point where we were not open to being or receiving critique, um, either of the other or of ourselves. So I think hate, hate speech, of course, is, um, is terrible, sinful and dangerous and violent. But um, is there a space for um, radical engagement, which includes the possibility of critique of the other, as well as being open to critique of one's own tradition and defense of one's own tradition? Thank you very much, uh, Susan. Uh, coming to the difference between interfaith uh, dialogue and interfaith solidarity, um, I think I would just like to say that, uh, you know, when we go for a dialogue, you, the code word that I use um, working with the interfaith uh, uh, organization is radio. Okay, we, we introduce the word radio, and then we say inter, in interfaith dialogue, we need to have respect for each other and then active listening. Um, remember that it's not a debate, but a discussion. And then look at all statements as I statements, and then watch out for the oops and the ouch moments. For me, interfaith dialogue can happen within four walls. We can sit and have a dialogue. It is like uh, the doing the balcony theologies. Okay, you can sit very comfortably uh, on our easy chairs, look down from the balcony and write theologies. But interfaith solidarity calls us out of this. It is very, very important that we raise our voice. We are present there. That is what the COVID-19 situation has showed us. You know, people from different parts of the world, their cry for justice, their, them seeking the truth takes them out, uh, you know, uh, not, uh, not really worried about their own lives. I wouldn't say go out and then do that, especially at this time. But when people are pushed to the corners, then they have no other option. Thank you. And I do believe that ecumenics, e ecclesiology, economy, ecology, and ethics are all interconnected search for the truth and acts of loving kindness is the antidote for hate speech and mm -hmm. racism. And there, I think the uh, engagement of body sol solidarity is very essential. I hope I have answered your question. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this uh, this would need more time also to, but it but it gives us shows us a, a new direction. I feel uh, moving beyond uh, just verbal uh, dialogue uh, to to really this this solidarity. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, Sione, we continue with with uh, with your uh, paper that you have prepared. Uh, I have introduced you already, um, but I think uh, it's uh, it's good to jump into that paper now to add the wisdom that you that you have uh, collected and assembled there. So please go ahead. So 
and this will be the paper burdens upon brown minds and as soon as we have the slides up so that Sione can also see that Sorry, um, no problem. Correu van en la cuarta puta de go go a faki y en mon hace tu tacta cada tag de fai gi forma tala queni. The longer paper um is based on two presuppositions. Number one is that racism is everywhere, from Rome to Athens to Jerusalem to Gaza, to Senegal, to Kingston, to Bogota, to Papa Etienne around racism is everywhere. Racism in, is in places of worship and in courthouses, in white houses and in brothels, in boats carrying refugees, in the tracks of migrants, and even in the channels of AI, racism is everywhere. In scriptures, in novels and in modern media, racism is in sport fields and in the fields of labors. And I would not be surprised if racism is going to be in heaven, whoever gets there, and in hell, I'll let you know. Everywhere we have racism. My second presupposition is that racism is more than the black and white struggles. My focus in this reflection is for brown folk. Brown I use as a code for people who do not fit the white and black experiences. By brown, I'm privileging people like me who have experienced racism from both white and black folk. I acknowledge that I have also experienced racism from other brown folk also. Brown is about not fitting the divide, the system that is driven by white supremacy. For brown people, and this is the burden of brown minds, there are two tasks. Number one, we need to deal with the fact that our brownness or our otherness has been whitened. White supremacy calls us brown. White supremacy decides how we are brown and what it means to be brown. And white supremacy expects us to say, thanks be to the Lord. So our first task is to deal with the whiteness, with the, how we have been whitened. And we do that by both exposing how we are whitened and rewriting what it means to be brown. One way of rewriting is what I prefer, which is going native. By going native, we privilege native texts and native wisdom. Be warned, um, I stepped on a few toes in my paper and I hope, uh, and I, I will be stepping on more toes in this presentation. I'm not calling for the usual approach to contextualization and interculturalization because those approaches, those old forms of contextualization are part of the whitened project. This is not a call to use native text to make sense of dominant texts, for example, the Bible which is part of that whitened, whitening project. This is not a call to use native wisdom to locate dominant texts and dominant theologies, dominant teachings, so they could continue the missionary agenda. This, rather, this is a call to appreciate native texts for what they are and native wisdom for what they are. Going native. In my paper, I talked about coconut. And I talk about coconut because coconut is one of our trees of life in Pacifica. There are coconuts in other parts of the world and I honor that. But my focus here is on Pacifica coconuts. I grew up with pride. I was proud of being a coconut. I am a coconut. And when I call someone a coconut, it is my way of saying that she or he belongs with me and I belong alongside he or she. This was the case in the late 50s and early 60s in Pacifica. 
In the 50s and 60s, what became known as coconut theology emerged. The people who propagated coconut theology did not talk about contextual theology at that time. This was a native theology, not too interested in fitting the expectations of systematic theology, but more interested in serving local elements as the body and blood of Christ. Body, coconut theology was about food, eating and drinking, rather than theory and dogma. At that time, and in the eyes of coconut theology, being coconuts was about who we are. But the coconut, our coconut, has been whitened, due in part to migration in the late 60s and early 70s, in the case of Pacifica. Coconut became a metaphor for being brown on the outside, but white in the inside. This understanding was given to our people, to brown people, by the white diaspora society. Our coconut has been whitened. This image here is quite interesting. A coconut is when you are Mexican and don't speak Spanish or don't know Spanish. It assumes that Spanish is a native language of the land now known as Mexico. But Spanish, like English, is a colonial language. So my claim is that anyone, black, white, or brown, who buys into this way of thinking that a coconut is brown on the outside but white in the inside has been whitened and is bred and is spreading a product of and a product for whitening. What we need to do is to rewrite or reclaim our coconuts. And this is part of the burden of the brown mind. I share in my paper one of the native texts, Sina and the Eel. This is a, a story from Samoa, where Sina is a young, beautiful woman, a Taupo, whose beauty is told throughout the, the, the group of Samoa and, and spills over to the other islands in the, in the region. The young man heard about Sina's beauty and he came to check her out. He came and found that Sina, goes to the rock pool to have her bath. So he, he changed himself into an eel and went into the pool and waited for Sina. They got to know each other. They became friends. And to cut the long story short, he wanted Sina to marry her, him. The eel is Tuna in the Samoan language and many of our languages. Sina wouldn't do that. So she stopped coming to the pool. And that almost killed this tuna, the eel. And he decided that when he dies, he sent a message to Sina saying, after I die, please take my head and bury it. And out of the ground, there will be a tree. And from that tree, you can build your house and you can give the tree the fruit to your children. This is the, co the beginning of the coconut tree in Samoa. When you husk a coconut, you can see the face of the tuna. It's not the face of a human, but the face of a water creature. This is not a story. The coconut in this story is not about being white or want to be white, but about food. Feed your children. It is about material for building and security. It is about being a tree of life and, of course, about being crazy. That's what I mean by claiming our, sharing our native texts. New wisdom or native wisdom, new is the word in Pacifica for coconut. Theologies of redemption and resurrection make sense in cultures where afterlife and reincarnation are part of their thinking and belief. That is not the case in native Pacifica. There is continuity between generations and fluidity across ages or eras so that the ancestors are not removed from the present. Actually, we in the present live in the world of the ancestors. We in Pacifica have a different orientation, but we have also been whitened. In this image here, taken in Tuvalu, but you see a lot of this in, in Tuvalu and the other islands of Pacifica, you can see there is a one coconut tree growing on top of another one, or one coconut tree is pushing up 
the other coconut trees. There are many explanations for this. I'll share two of, of them with you. Number one is that imagine that there's a pile of coconuts. There's a coconut that grows on the top of the pile, and then there's another coconut that grows at the bottom, and the one in the bottom grows up and pushes or lifts up the one on top. One coconut lifts the other one up. The other explanation is a coconut tree is disturbed, such as the condition of, that, that, that we see in climate change, and the tree has a second life. It lifts itself up, and this is what I call new life, coconut style, new life. Resurrection is not part of our native culture, but relationship is. So a theology of lifting the other and lifting yourself makes more sense than being saved by someone else. This new wisdom does not need to be certified by some biblical teaching. It stands on its own ground. And this is an example of native wisdom at work. The burden of the brown mind is to be in solidarity with victims of racism, and at the same time to call out their and our moments of racism. The burden of the brown mind is to deal with how brownness has been whitened. The burden of the brown mind includes rewriting and reclaiming our brownness, giving our coconut back. The burden of the brown mind is to go native by affirming native texts and native wisdom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sione. For the coconut, <clears throat> for the coconut wisdom uh, that you bring from the Pacifica, um, I want to turn immediately to Karen, uh, not to lose time. Karen, you have been invited to uh, give a response to this uh, very inspiring paper of Sione. Let me quickly introduce you to uh, the audience here. Archdeacon Karen Kaim. Uh, is an Aboriginal woman from the Biripi Nation in southeastern Australia. She's a member of the Anglican Church in the Canberra Goulburn uh, Diocese, and Karen provides advice on the provision of social services to the Abor Aboriginal people, and she leads reconciliation across the region. Uh, Karen is also a researcher and a member of the World Council of Churches Indigenous Peoples Ecumenical Network. Karen, thanks a lot for being with us and over to you. You have to unmute Karen, please. There you go. Thank you. And what a privilege it was to review this paper. Um, so deeply insightful. I guess I want to begin by saying that every culture has its unique worldviews and knowledges, its own ways of being, thinking and doing. Um, and this was brought out so beautifully in this, in this paper. Within Australia, Karen Martin highlights this in her work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The paper by Sione reflects this when he refers to the reclamation of heritage by people of the Pacific nations. Reclaiming heritage whilst calling out racism and white privilege forms part of the decolonizing process. And this is commented on, and he teases this out in the identity politics of the church and of black women in particular, so relevant. Within Australia, black women and black minds are often depicted as somehow deficient, both physically and emotionally. For instance, white privilege within the church continues to ensure that the removal of black children from their parents is amongst the highest in the world, since the mothering style of black women is somehow judged as being deficient and as somehow a danger to the child. Well, this paper outlines how the epistemologies and knowledges of Pacifica scholars is marginalized by race, by the cultural superiority inherent within Palangi minds and privileges. Indigenous Australians experience such in the everyday activities of academia that seeks to marginalize Aboriginal voices and worldviews. And as an academic, um, I have a lot of personal experience in relation to that, as well as my other Aboriginal colleagues. And as in many of our other institutions, such as the church, we experience that also. 
It is here where colonial ideologies dominate and where Aboriginal worldviews and ways of relating are marginalised. Hence, there are few Aboriginal people within the church in Australia. Those who do participate are mostly evangelical, a tradition that within Australia actively builds walls between believers and non-believers. The expression that racist ideologies build walls on the bodies and spirits of black people is profound. For one cannot ignore the violence of racism and its potential to harm the soul, particularly that of young people. Sione's paper highlights how such ideologies build walls between black people, particularly in relation to identity, whilst using the analogy of coconuts. And I love that this analogy is a form of belonging for Pacifica peoples. However, within Australia, it is derogatory and used to determine who is in and who is out of belongingness between us. It is also interesting to note that this common analogy was used within Australia at all, given that coconuts do not form part of our cultures, nor the dreaming of our people. And when I use that term dreaming, it's similar to um, what Sione was recently just saying about uh, the importance of our past um, and the heart of our spirituality. That term is used a lot in Australia. This form of marginalisation between black people is a response to the long-term experience of oppression and occurs when people who are victims of a situation of dominance turn on each other rather than confront the system that oppresses them. A lateral violence is internalised colonialism that is a result of racist ideologies and discrimination. And this paper refers to the wedge of racism in relation to his own people, hence the oppressed internalise the image that the dominant power creates of them. Finally and beautifully, this paper highlights the central nature of Talanoa to Pacifica worldviews and ways of relating. Indeed, the sharing of stories is also at the heart of Aboriginal ways of being and doing. It is the means by which our culture and heritage is transmitted to future generations. It is the vehicle of identity and belonging. When Aboriginal people meet, relationship it builds and, and it occurs through what we call yarning, through the giving and receiving of story of what Sione's paper so eloquently describes as story weaving. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Sione, do you want to quickly react to that directly or shall we allow others to join? Just to quickly say thank you, Karen. I, I, I will follow up on your paper, but I appreciate the yarning that you have engaged with. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. So, any comments? Uh, very rich, uh, very rich discussion indeed. Uh, well, triggered by by your provocative thoughts, uh, Sione. Um, I think. Uh, I mean, one of one of the provocations in your paper is, of course, uh, to uh, what I hear you pointing at is. Let's look at the and also that was in your in your reaction to or the response to Elizabeth paper. Um, it is it is time to for critical interrogation, uh, and I see you continuing. I mean, I've I've always seen you doing that, uh, not to use biblical texts uh, and search for individual biblical texts that help us to dismantle racism uh, and uh, delegitimize that but go the other way around and actually um, put ourselves at risk by wrestling with the very difficult texts that seem to support uh, white supremacy or that, that, that were easy to exploit for white supremacy and legitimizing that uh, with, a, with a Christian use of the Hebrew Bible. Um, that, that is, I find that timely and also, uh, yes, it, a, a challenge to to all of our theologies or i should say for for my way of doing theology yes 
Um, maybe we should, if there's no immediate uh, question, I'm sure there are lots of questions, but uh, you, you are all behaving so well and you all uh, are because I warned you about the time that we, uh, the limitation of time that we have, uh, we, because we have yet another paper and the short response uh, and we have 30 more minutes to go, um, but I will uh, give Peter Crossley uh, the, the microphone now uh, and then after that we will, we will go to the next and the third and the last paper for today. Peter, go ahead. Thank you so much, Sione. Profound and disturbing. Great. I want to uh, acknowledge that and, and uh, greet you in that way. I want to also ask, as we began yesterday, to entwine the fall of whiteness with the fall of Christianity. And even out of the paper this morning um, from Elizabeth, looking at a kind of broader historical view of how religions may be a form of peace speech, but also very deeply a form of hate speech. So what are the methodologies for native wisdom to deal with its own tradition of hate speech? And so, and I'm just curious to know how to, how, um, what your kind of sense is of, as you privilege this particular, and rightly so, part of your own identity, how it itself is not uh, free, presumably, of the same urge to violence. Can you share a little more, Sione, please? That, that, that requires a really long conversation, uh, Peter. Um, but let me just say that, that part of, of our Talanoa or yarning culture is there is no one legend. There's not one legend about Sina and Tuna. There's no one legend about this rainbow or that, you know. The, so the multiplicity is part of what it means to have this native wisdom. Part of the struggles that, that we have with scripture or the Bible is that there's an authoritative element and there's something about truth that can only be one or sacred or holy or canonized. So, but this, there's a, a long conversation that we need to have, but thank you. Thank you very much. Well, this, this also reminds us that, uh, that uh, a real Talanoa uh, is when you sit together on a mat, you're invited to, uh, to sit on the mat and time stops. Uh, we have experienced that uh, when we uh, were hosted by uh, communities uh, in the Pacific region um last year uh and that that was it, it was the beginning of this year january uh and that was fascinating to see the wisdom of the pacific people in the pacific the, the ex exactly what you described and what you what you embody actually sioni uh the the combination and the ability and the art of interweaving um traditional wisdom with uh, a Christian spirituality combined with political action. I've I've never seen that before in in this uh, in this way. And and I I thought again, the ecumenical family really uh, we all need to come and sit on your mats uh, again in order to deconstruct and de-learn some of the things that uh, that we have been taught. Thank you so much, uh, Sione. Uh, over to Karen one more time. Karen, uh, I have introduced you before, so uh, no more words from my side here. Please, let's quickly jump into your paper. Uh, and as I said yesterday, uh, these papers will be published, so don't be nervous, uh, whoever is watching this. Uh, you, will, you will see the rich wisdom here, and you can read that later also. So this is just uh, teasing here and triggering some of your, some of your thoughts. Uh, Karen, go ahead, please. Okay, so, all right, so um, I just want to uh, just introduce my paper um, and I'm, I'm talking about Aboriginal voices and uh, what does that inequality look like in the church? Uh, to begin, I'd like to just sort of outline that I'm going to be touching on 
uh, I'm going to begin and end with story because it's uh, so much of how, you know, about our way of being and doing as Aboriginal people here in Australia. Story is central at, to our way of relating. I'm going to talk about racism and discrimination within society in general and then focus on the church and then bring us back with um, with Aboriginal wisdom, the wisdom of our people in relationship to, to what is our calling and pose that question. But to begin, I'd just like to, I said I'd talk about my own story to begin with. So I just want to highlight a little bit about um, Southeastern Australia and the people that I belong to and the people that I work with. Um, here we have an image of the highlands and they are the Ngunnawal people and, and we work with these people and their culture is uh, quite incredible. They're the people of the highlands, um, traditionally quite mobile across their country and, uh, and it's mountainous and it's where the, um, the snowy mountains are as well. And in contrast, I work with the Bakanji people people who live in flat, hot, dry country, and their culture and lifestyle is very different again. And then finally, I, I, I work and live in Wiradjuri country, and Wiradjuri people are known as the river people, and all of their stories um, and their spirituality is about the river. So the cultures of southeastern Australia, including my own as a Biripa woman, are really rich and deep and vibrant cultures. So I said that I'd begin with my own story. Um, I grew up in Western Sydney um, and um, at the time in the 60s and 70s, we had a lot of refugees coming to that city. And um, it was really quite an amazing time because so many risked their lives coming to a strange country and watching their uh, struggles to establish themselves was quite amazing as a young person growing up. And my mother, a, an Aboriginal woman, a Biripa woman, she worked in an industry that was very male domin dominated. Um, and I saw her experiences of being a black woman in a male dominated industry. And in those days, I remember going with my father because she had been um, put in overnight jails uh, incorrectly, inappropriately, you know, and having to go with him to get her out of prison. Um, and, and the experiences of my grandparents when they moved to the city, they had to flee their country, our Biripa country, our beautiful country, and they had to flee there when they were removing children in the stolen generations here. And they came to Sydney and um, they were quite amazing people because they started, amidst all the poverty, they started the first musicals in the centre of Sydney for Aboriginal people who had come there and were fringe dwellers. But in 1938, um, on the 26th of January, which is Australia Day, which most Australians still celebrate, uh, it was 150 years of invasion. So for them, they, um, they demonstrated in um, Australia House, this is the, an image of the first meeting of Aboriginal people who for the first time brought to the attention of all Australians what was happening to their people across Australia in the missions and the reserves. And I guess I'm highlighting this because I said story is really important to our people, but we forget to talk about the heroes within our families across the generations and the heroes within our communities. So such experiences, um, you know, the struggle, such experiences are common to many Indigenous Australians, where the struggles of those who have gone before them has become a part of their identity as a marginalised people, a silenced people. It is from such experiences that future leaders are born. On the East Coast, it's from places such as Irambi, Bogabilla Missions, where, to use an expression of our people, leaders have been grown or sung. Indeed, at every stage of black and white history, the state has implanted rented policies with the aim of dispossessing Australia's first people from their country, a policy not unlike the way in which we process refugees well away from other Australians to locations of our shores. And I see this repetition in our policies across the generations. 
And while Aboriginal people were eventually recognised as citizens in 1967, black lives have never mattered here. Barnes asserts that policies such as the spiralling removal of Aboriginal children from their families and the incarceration of Aboriginal men and women are tools of colonisation, reflecting the ongoing structural racism pervasive within Australian institutions. Too often when we are uh, we hear about racism and discriminate when we when we have we talk about colonisation, it's spoken of in the past. And I think that's um that's a great disservice as to what is happening at the present. Research conducted by Westerman reveals how experiences of racism and discrimination can feel like a violent assault to the victim. We forget about that impact. We know that it can impact people physically through the loss of opportunity. We know that it can impact one emotionally, producing anxiety and often distress. However, it also impacts one spiritually. It makes one question their identity and indeed hope for the future. First Nation families continue to be monitored and controlled by white practices where their ways of doing and being are held up against white hegemonic practices, especially through child protection agencies. We live and work within a discriminatory environment where the colour of your skin, amongst other categories, provides opportunity for racist and unjust behaviours in Melbourne, for instance, studies have found that the experiences of, in particular, young Sudanese refugee men, as with Aboriginal men, are many more times more likely to be approached by police than white Australians. It is not surprising then that within the church, discrimination also flourishes. With the history of working in partnership with the state, it struggles to relinquish colonising ideologies. Indeed, the Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin, Britain's black woman bishop, asserted that the existence of racism in wider society was not an excuse for it within the church. However, within Australia, Indigenous people continue to be vulnerable to racism and underrepresented across all areas of the church. My own collating as the only female Indigenous archdeacon is an example of this, and it begs the question, why are there so few Aboriginal leaders? The crux of racist attitudes within Australia are rooted in the long-standing relationship between the state and the church. We have a long history of working together, notwithstanding the theoretical separation of powers. Australian societal attitudes and behaviours towards Aboriginal people is born of the corrupt relationship between these two institutions and their inherent ethnocentrism. The two together were a force of complete annihilation which deemed Aboriginal people culturally and socially inferior. It was this belief that enabled the church's silence during the committed massacres, the enslavement, the introduced diseases and widespread poisoning, as well as the ongoing desecration of Aboriginal land, families and communities. While some of the early church missions sought to assist and protect Aboriginal people from the worst of the colonising activities, such as protection, such protection facilitated the cultural genocide of Aboriginal people and the removal of our children. In a key study, Emerson and Smith found that white Christians deny the existence of structural racism far more than for non-Christians. Moreover, discrimination remains strong within Australian churches as they become increasingly evangelical in their mission. With the narrowing of beliefs surrounding God's salvation, language of otherness is more commonly used. For instance, one is a believer or a non-believer, saved or not saved. In the case of the former, one becomes automatically the other. Evangelism has encouraged increasingly rigid views of who is in and who is out. Smith refers to evangelical rationalism, a version of religion that makes saying yes to a list of beliefs central to the faith. Within this tradition, there is no room for otherness, no room for expressing Jesus differently. As a black woman and archdeacon, pressure to conform to an evangelical mould was experienced at all levels, within and across the church. This pressure most often came from white male church leaders and is reflected in the growing preference for young, white, middle-class, heterosexual men as leaders 
within the church. Seems to be the norm. Furthermore, Australian evangelists reflect, reject truth-telling on the church's role in colonising black people. Truth-telling is really difficult here um, and we are still battling that. Sociologists Emerson and Smith found that the white evangelists had a limited toolkit for dealing with racism since white evangelists construed faith individualistically as a personal relationship with Jesus, their faith and theology offered it a limited capacity to understanding social issues. Thus, white evangelicals do recognise racism, or when they do, they see it as a personal issue, a sin requiring repentance, not as a structural injustice requiring rectification. For evangelicals, the solution is found within relationships rather than social justice and societal transformation. So the centering of one's faith to the individual and not to the common good ensures that nothing changes. In relation to Aboriginal participation, this has limited it enormously. So I just want to, I know I'm coming to the end, but I, I just want to highlight a story um, and I, I include this in my paper, and it's one of our dreaming stories. It's a sacred story, and it's about when the world was new. And, and when the world was new, the sky uh, was very low to the ground, and uh, the animals um, tried to change it and tried to, to raise the roof of, of the sky so that they could hop about and the birds could fly and that they could stand erect as they were made to do. And the birds got together along with the other animals and the birds decided that if they used uh, sticks, they could gradually raise the, the roof of the sky. And so they went to the nearby hills and raised the roof of the sky and they became really excited. So they raised it a little bit more and they were saying, look, it's moving, it's moving. And as they raised it even more, um, the sky burst open. And all of a sudden, as opposed to being a very dark and dim world, all of a sudden they gazed in amazement at the light and the warmth and the beauty of the sun woman. And um, that is why the birds uh, sing so beautifully every morning, because they're greeting the sun woman. And I like to use Aboriginal stories, dreaming stories, when I'm, when I'm talking about theology, because they are so rich and deep and multi-layered in meaning. We have the birds working on behalf of the common good and we have everyone working together. And some of those birds were quite frail and didn't have the power to move the sky. So it's all about uh, everyone has a role, has the right to live in dignity and the importance of the common good and the importance of the more powerful caring um, and enabling the dignity of others. And that is part of our wisdom as Aboriginal people. And it's found beautifully within our stories. And so I'd like to go back to our calling of a church that, you know, the respect for the wisdom of, of all people um, and especially uh, Indigenous peoples, I think, and that we uh, do what is right and we do what is right for the common good, not because of... of um, you know, Christian duty, but that we all have the right to live in dignity and in peace. Um, and, and so I, I guess I'm ending with story um, and I would like to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you, Karen. Thanks a lot. Uh, if we would uh, be physically present, I'm, I'm sure there would be a rousing applause uh, for, for your inspiration uh, and, and sharing. It really, really wonderful. We have invited uh, Jennifer Martin to uh, respond uh, to your paper. And uh, we, uh, let me introduce Jennifer Martin to you uh, from Jamaica. She's a member of the United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands. Jennifer is the Education and Mission Secretary of the Caribbean and North America Council for Mission. Uh, Jennifer is also a career productor with a lifelong interest in equality issues, both area, areas, employment and research. 
Uh, within the World Council of Churches, uh, Jennifer Martin is a well-known uh, person and highly respected as a member of the executive group of the World, the World Council of Churches Commission on World Mission and Evangelism. And uh, she's also a co-moderator of the International Reference Group of the Pilgrimage of Justice and Peace. Jennifer, welcome and over to you. You have to also unmute Jennifer, please. Jennifer, I think you have to, yes. yes. Can you, yeah, now. what a good plan. My, my only regret is that I'm limited and warned to speak for five minutes only. What, what, a, what a beautiful people. Let me go right to my notes. Um, Karen, I really wish to express thanks for her, to you for having produced such a beautiful paper. I'm very honored to be in a position to offer a short response. Um, she has written and presented a very difficult and often painful subject in such a sensitive, incisive, and knowledgeable manner that it is impossible not to be moved by what we have heard even while we were learning. She has managed to introduce a degree of calmness to a discussion which defies the church not to see if not to accept its culpability. The church in Australia, as indeed in other colonial spaces, has played a deliberate and distressing role in planting and nourishing inequality in the church. The irony is that the church was and is called with God's help to uphold fullness of life for all. Now this is from my, my previous knowledge of Aboriginal life over the years, has not been absent, but it has been limited. So I, I, I watched quite a few documentaries in my earlier life by, by John Pilger, and I, and, I, and I read things. But um, coming to this work now again afresh really points out to me that Indigenous Australian people have a commitment to survive against the odds. This article has provided some useful insights and deeper understandings of their tenacity. We're given a glimpse of some strategies for combating inequality employed by those having a desire to remain in the church. Being very interested in church growth myself, I cannot help but consider how, with a more inclusive and welcoming church um, approach, the church among the indigenous people could grow and thrive. We, we still have the question as to why it is if we are saying we want persons to join, they've been so badly treated. The NGOs um, would still have a place, but would not seem to be replacing aspects of the church's role. In a quietly passionate voice, with an invitational and inclusive tone, the writer draws us into a world which presents some Aboriginal voices powerfully and persuasively, sharing parts of their experience of life in Australia and in the Christian church. In an enthralling introduction, we are drawn into memories of an amazing Sydney and the wonderful family autobiography, autobiography which is shared. We cannot help but think how many other persons of the Aboriginal people have equally intriguing stories we don't have, which um, do not get a chance to tell their stories. I'm rushing here. This is a story also of the removal of Aboriginal children from their families, social justice campaigns and actions. And it is quite heartrending to know that some of the policies which still exist in social services continue to disempower and discriminate against Aboriginal children. Um, for it is, it is not surprising that Reverend Kimmel would have grown up to have been an activist, a, a leader, a storytelling person, and to have risen to the position of archdeacon. Yet she remains a steadfast dreamer. For me, that is part of the beauty of the presentation. Her, her achievements have not removed her from being her core self. This article is replete with references which locate voices within the context of academic reflections, yet the writer still successfully grounds a piece secure by the storytelling of First Nation cultures. Her opening sentence reminds us that it is an inseparable part of First people's cultures in Australia. The writer confidently positions herself within her own culture, therefore bringing, therefore 
bringing authenticity to her observations and critiques of her society and church. She does not give credence to one part of her life only, but to her entire life. And this really positions her strongly. So we're, we're able to confidently follow her expansive views. This achievement within the church places Karen in a singular position and further qualifies her to write on the subject. Her position in the church is a symbol of endurance and the chipping away at inequities. The article gives an indication of her understanding of her part in calling the church to provide an invitation to all. She positions herself and indeed does challenge the church to look at its, its own culpability in how the persons have been treated over, over time. And to say that at this modern time, the church really has no option but to repent. I'm putting in that word, to repent of how it has treated people and not to continue to view racism as a personal sin, but to claim the institutional nature of this beast and to use its considerable power to, to break, up, break up those bad parts of itself and to create a better life and a better society for people. I could say more, but I see Fernando looking at me saying, so I have stopped. Thank you very much. And I'm really excited to have, have had this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. Uh, the good thing is that Jennifer Martin can read my face. We have been working together for quite a long time. So she knows exactly what's going on in my mind. Uh, being the moderator, I also have to take care of the time. Uh, Karen, we have uh, two more minutes uh, for you. Do you, anything you want to uh, say and add to, to your paper? You, know, you have to unmute, Karen. Karen, you have to unmute your microphone. Thank you. Yep, yep, yep. No, no, I, I have no further questions. Good. Uh, then I will not uh, open the floor here again, because when we start now to talk about all the, the important aspects uh, from truth telling to uh, the reconciliation work that you are involved in, um, uh, it is, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that we will, we will, I will not be able to close it then in, in two minutes, that would be impossible. Uh, but this is also to say and express our gratitude, uh, Karen, to, to your presence here and also for sharing your insights, uh, also your personal story, uh, how that is part of uh, the whole topic that we are discussing here. Uh, I mean, this, this is what makes our discussions, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what makes our discussions so rich is uh, once we start to allow our personal stories uh, to be uh, to, to shine through uh, all this systemic racism, the systemic evil, but also the beauty of, um, of overcoming uh, some of that injustice. Uh, this, is, this is when it becomes real and, and also life-changing. So I thank you for that, for that, for that inspiration. Uh, thanks to also again to Sione um, for, for that inspiration. We need to continue to talk about uh, uh, what you pointed to again, and yesterday we had the same uh, topic about the legal aspects uh, of this structural violence, because it occurred to me yesterday, but also today again, that the crazy thing is that this white, uh, this whiteness uh, has managed to build uh, the uh, structural evil into legal systems. And now it's really easy for, uh, for a white person to always, you know, claim law and order and for law and to keep up law and order, uh, we have to do this and that. Uh, and then it seems just to be neutral, you know, and, and everybody has to agree. So I need, we need to continue with that um, discussion. Elizabeth, thanks again. We need, uh, we will pick up the interreligious dimension uh, of this, of course, uh, being inspired by your paper and your Christological reflection on it. Uh, let, let us close uh, with a moment of prayer. We have, uh, I, that, these will be my last words. Uh, and then I will uh, just quickly announce the next session. Let's have a moment of silence prayer.
God, we thank you again for the wisdom of indigenous peoples who might lead us all into deconstructing racism, injustice. We thank you for the stories, the inspiration that they continue to bring to the ecumenical table because we realize gradually that we depend on that wisdom if we want to live in your creation respectfully. Bless us as we go on in this day in our relations and help us to become peacemakers in your name. Amen. We will have the next session uh, tomorrow and uh, that will be another opportunity to continue with these discussions. Uh, it is again, of course, about structural racism, colonialism, uh, brilliant speakers, uh, Mark McDonald, for example, will help us to continue, especially with the, uh, with the wisdom of indigenous peoples. Um, that will be, that is something to look forward to. That's it for today. Thanks so much. Blessings to all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.